Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays at the Fine Arts Museums. We are so thrilled that you're able to join us tonight. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and every Wednesday night, my team and I work hard to center representation and build relationships with art in unexpected and meaningful ways. Tonight's program is in support of the exhibition, The De Young Open, which hangs on our museum walls right now as we sadly had to close our doors due to COVID regulations. This beautiful salon style exhibition is installed floor to ceiling and is in celebration of the De Young's 125th anniversary. It features works by 762 Bay Area artists and hosts 877 artworks. This exhibition continues the museum's longstanding tradition of engaging the local community and showcasing the talent of Bay Area artists. It was very important to Claudia that we highlight the film program. Our media room features 20 local artists working in the medium of moving images, but I'll let Claudia explain further. Claudia Schmuckli is the inaugural curator in charge of contemporary art and programming. Her accolades are parallel to none. Please visit our website to learn more about the exhibitions and commissions Claudia has brought to our museum since she joined us in 2016. Currently, I believe Claudia, as a thoughtful, prolific curator, is working on at least seven major exhibitions, either on view right now or in process. It is such an honor to introduce to you Claudia Schmuckli. Thank you, Fran. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome four of the 20 artists represented in the film program of the De Young Open. Born in Campeche, Mexico, Miguel Novello is based between the Bay Area and the Yucatan Peninsula. His films and interactive installations employ storytelling to create spaces of memory and explore the aesthetics of loss and miscommunication. Gazelle Zamizai was born in Kabul, Afghanistan and raised in rural Washington state. Her films and photographs reflect the complexities and contradictions of culture, nationality, and gender through the lens of her bicultural identity. Angele Kayanu is an Oglala Lakota artist whose work in printmaking, film, and sculpture approaches her indigenous homeland as a dynamic site of cultural practice to explore questions of identity and remembrance. Tina Takemoto is a filmmaker exploring hidden dimensions of same-sex intimacy and trauma in Asian and Asian American history. Using found footage, which they manipulate through labor-intensive manual processes, they create immersive historical fantasies. The film program is a special selection of the De Young Open presented in the media room. As an expansive survey of artistic activity in the Bay Area, the De Young Open celebrates our creative community's resilience and courage in the face of a global crisis where viruses, both biological and social, are ravaging our society. Representing a small sample of the kind of artistic excellence present in the De Young Open, the work by these four artists are connected through a shared sensibility of searching and longing, whether that is for identity, history, community, or an aesthetic vocabulary that captures their experience. While their formal strategies may differ, ranging from the documentary to fiction, to montage and installation, all of them share a proclivity for experimentation within the medium of film and beyond. I welcome Miguel, Gazelle, Angelica and Tina. And I would invite you Miguel to kick it off. Thank you. My name is Miguel Novello, and this is 30 seconds of La Marea, or The Tide. Um, the Tide is a multi-form documentary that I made a few years ago, and I've been doing iterations of it every time I get to show it anywhere. Um, so the, the piece that is at the young is 
uh, quite, no, it's not unique that it's not, doesn't have or share parts of other iterations, but it's specifically different than the other versions that I've shown. Um, La Marea or the Tide is, depicts the life of Jorge. Jorge is a previous student of mine in Seba Playa. Uh, we became friends after he took the third workshop with me. And I got fascinated by his dream of succeeding in Campeche, where we are from, where I'm from, where he's from. Um, how that narrative conflicted with my own personal story of trying to migrate to the United States. I thought that was the Mexican dream because in a way I also just want to stay home or like, yeah, just succeed in home. And over a span of two months, we get to reflect on that, record that. I think I was just trying to capture life and trying to create this dream state in order so I can just reflect myself with him and with each other and share that into many forms. And the idea of having a multiple iterations of the, this piece is because I think that's what life is. It's just like a, a form that it's, it's never a solid state. It's always changing. That's what the tide is, like goes up and down. It's always ever changing. Um, I think La Marea or the Tide makes you perceive these things that you might think are simple, but like once you don't have them, you, you realize you take, it, take those times and moments for granted. And well, in fact, those are the moments that are the most precious ones. Um, I feel this project a way of researching myself in the eyes of Jorge or through his perspective. Um, it was a very life-changing experience um, of working and trying to convey the, something that is always forming new ideas and I'm not, I'm not like entirely sure like um, what is gonna end or how it's gonna be. Uh, and I, I think this is what I enjoy in my practice, just like I'm always in the looks for things the unexpected. Um, I think that's what life is. I think that's what I'm looking for in most of my practice, just like representation of life. I think that's what attracts me the most. Um, and, and I think that's La Marea, just like a, a, a moment where you can like lose yourself in the storms and the rain in the water, and then just go back and see within each, yourself. Um, lately, after I'm done with La Marea, and finally I'm done, uh, it's online, a version of it. If you type lamarea.cineola, you'll get a glimpse and different versions of it if you wanna see it online. Um, but it will be different than the version that is at the young, FYI. Um, so now I'm done with that. I'm working in a new project that is mainly based on cenotes and meteorites. Um, and I, this is, I think, what La Marea got me, this inner research in order to ask bigger questions that relate to the universe. Um, here's uh, some images of my latest body of work where I'm grabbing a lot of the style and form that I got from La Marea into a more constructed and more innate form of me of image creation and sound creation. And, and, and I guess this is what I wanna leave my talk in, just what I'm going for now. Thank you. Thanks, Miguel. Can you talk a little more about the environment that we're looking at here in the slides? I mean, is, this, sure. is this a constructed environment or is this part of the, the film? Um, can, yeah, can you be a more specific there? It's been very interesting For sure. to see. Yeah, I don't, but I'm not really sure what I'm looking at. Definitely. This is a video piece, a nine minute video piece of a tunnel that we start from the very back and then we go close and close and close to my final image. Um, it's a 3D render world building constructed. And I think even if La Marea feels like it's a very, um, 
like unconstructed space. I think the editing and the artifacts of like just seeing glimpses of it adds this mediated form of seeing life. And I think this is what I'm trying to recreate with this new body of work. I wanna recreate, even if I'm not there, I wanna recreate that sense of life. Like, yeah, that's what I'm looking for now. Like I wanna recreate life. And what are they, so what are the imagery, uh, what, what other imagery will we be seeing in this new work other than what we're looking at here on, on screen? Right, so basically it's, uh, I'm dancing. Oh, you're I'm dancing, dancing to, yeah, I'm dancing through the whole piece. Uh, I'm dancing and you cannot see it in the beginning. Um, I'm dancing to Chuck, the God of Rain. Um, and I'm dancing in order to understand what I'm looking for in this new body of work. This is one of many pieces that I'll be working on. Uh, there are hopefully gonna be most of them video installations. Um, mm -hmm. In doing this research of the meteorite that fall in Chicxulub, this is a meteorite that destroyed the dinosaurs and created the cenotes. The cenotes are these caverns filled of water. So this is what I'm thinking of. And this is the first piece of many, hopefully, where I'm researching, um, I'm researching this fascination of death and creation of life. Um, so that's why we have this tunnel that gets you to my understanding of life, which is the end, me dancing. Yeah. I, you know, one thing that struck me um, about La Marea and the way that you talk about it, um, spaces, times, existences, how does that come into play here too? No, definitely. Um, over my research, I believe the mediator self, it's equally as real as my image. Uh, at what point, like this square where you're seeing right now, it's like not as real as like the one that you're seeing on the video or Jorge representing or standing in for me. I do believe, uh, yeah, I think I'm all about following that thread of thought. Um, living afar from home makes you realize and be in peace with that understanding that the people in little squares are equal as real as the, their body and flesh. Um, I do believe representation is as real as the thing that is representing. So yeah, definitely. I mean, this is a very strong connection. I do believe so with La Marea in terms of like how I'm using the body and the body and space and like the image that ho holds that representation. Yeah, definitely. Great, thank you. I think um, it's time to move on. So thanks, Miguel, and we can come back thank to you. this later. Gazelle, um, Samezai, uh, your video, um, The Hidden Line, really sort of caught my attention, um, both through sort of like its, uh, its, uh, its atmospheric qualities and, 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 and sort of the questions that it raises about um, who we are, where we are, and can you can you talk a little bit about the work, please, and and, and put it in context for us? Hi everyone, my name is Gazelle Samizai and Khata Penhan Hidden Line is about a young Afghan American girl who navigates the demands and pressures of her cultures. She follows a mysterious green ribbon which gets darker and darker until she's led to a gathering of masked uniform figures, her elders. Their masks are marked with Farsi calligraphy denoting different Afghan and American status symbols such as modesty, youth, beauty, wealth, etc. And I made those masks out of leather. In place of words, the mask figures draw black ribbons out of their mouths, hurling judgments and entangling her and preventing her escape. Pressuring, pressuring her to conform, they offer the girl a mask to wear and at first she declines, but out of desperation, she accepts and the ribbons disappear around her 
and she's able to see the figures as they see themselves, dressed in elegant attire and speaking eloquently. They start dancing and she joins, but finds that this still isn't enough to find belonging. She frantically tries to take off her mask, which seems to be stuck. Finally successful, the screen goes black and we see an overhead shot of the girl curled up in a fetal position. Perhaps this was just a bad dream, but as the camera zooms out, we see the ribbon strewn around her. Next slide, please. Much of my work explores familial history, cultural expectations, and gender norms. I find video particularly conducive to recreating the uncomfortable silences I've experienced within family and culture and to show the secrets that are buried within. I'm drawn to using threads as a symbol of both connection and burden. A couple other pieces that do this are Upon My Daughter and Ravel. In Upon My Daughter, several women collectively embroider the wedding dress of a young bride as she wears it. Each stitch symbolizes one piece of advice that she's given, a ritual that first begins as a loving and attentive act soon spirals into a frenzy of stitches and swift hand movements that end up cocooning her in the very things that would beautify her. In the act of preparing the bride, the women have participated in upholding the veils and traditions of marriage. The process has effaced and conformed her into the culturally appropriate woman, one who will obey social and familial expectations at the expense of her own freedom and happiness. Individually, the threads are very delicate, but amassed together, you can see that the power of them is very strong and visible. The tangled threads also symbolize the powerful yet complicated bonds between the women in this family. At the end of the video, the surrounding women disappear, leaving her to ponder if her experience of social pressure was internal or imposed by those around her. Unlike Upon My Daughter, which uses the do a closed domestic space, Ravel uses a barren landscape as a setting for psychological release. A woman embarks on a solitary journey with no clear destination. As she traverses a barren landscape, her emotional baggage becomes visible in the form of cork glass bottles tied to her back with thick twine. As the bottles multiply, her emotional burden becomes more visible. The bottles are empty, symbolizing that her hardships are meaningful to her, but imperceptible to others. The large expanse of landscape and open air allows for a somewhat public confession and release of her problems. There's no one there to confine, guide, or witness her journey toward freedom. Snapshots of the tree appear throughout acting as flashbacks or reminders as to why she's on this journey. The tree is a reflection of the woman. It still stands, but in a somewhat decrepit form, stripped down to a basic skeleton. Hanging from the tree are the bottles spinning in midair, unattainable and unreachable. The reminder of lost and unfulfilled hopes and dreams. As something that's been unrealized, they're in between creation and completion. Throughout the video, the number of bottles increases and decreases, showing the cyclical nature of this release. At the end, she walks without any burden into a vast landscape of possibility. Thank you. Thank you. So clearly the line is something that runs through your work as a leitmotif, whether it's in the photographic work and, and in the film, right? Um, and I, I found that to be obviously a very powerful trope in, in the film as well, because it builds up all this tension uh, at the beginning um, without, you know, without you knowing really where, where you will end up and whether, whether what the girl will find at the end of the rope is a form of, of release or, or, or danger. And I think that is really incredibly effective. It's nice to see it in, in the context of, of uh, the photography as well, because it really um, emphasizes how important a motif that is. Uh, does it carry uh, through more of your work as well? Um, is, is that um, one of the tropes that you work with the most? 
I'm definitely really drawn to the idea of threads. I would say um, these two pieces upon my daughter and Ravel are the ones that most explicitly use it. Mm -hmm. um, there's another piece I have called This Will Be the Last where a woman is washing a white bed sheet that keeps multiplying and multiplying. And so even though it's not a thread, there's still kind of this idea of this textile that kind of multiplies and becomes um, overburdening. Can you talk a little more about, um, about the masks? Because they were very intriguing. Um... Yeah, the idea of the masks was thinking about the way that we like present um, a certain identity to others in order to belong and how um, there are certain status indicators like beauty and wealth and modesty, um, wisdom, power, things that people perform um, to belong to a group. So I created the different masks um, with words denoting the different status indicators. And at one point in the film as well, when the person takes a mask off to offer it to the girl, there's also another mask underneath that one. So it also is looking at like how these identities can be layered um, and multifaceted. Yeah, and I feel that that's sort of a leitmotif like throughout, throughout much of the work that we're looking at today. Um, Talking about, yeah, layered identities, obviously a very uh, important um, subject and theme that, that I think all of you are exploring uh, through your work in, in different ways. And uh, uh, that search for history of community uh, is definitely also present, Tina, in, in your work. Um, and uh, I would love if we could maybe look at, at uh, your excerpt from On the Line, which is the work that you've chosen for the De Young Open. And, uh, and talk about that a little more in detail after. Thank you. Um, so my name is Tina or TT Takamoto. Um, and I use experimental filmmaking to explore queer Asian American history and identity. My work is often inspired by tiny traces of same sex intimacy that I find in queer and Asian and Asian American archives. On the Line is a short experimental film set in a Japanese American fishing village in San Diego in the 1930s. It is inspired by Isa Shimoda, a butch gender non-conforming immigrant who served meals around the clock to tuna cannery workers in her tiny restaurant on the docks. Shimoda was known for her masculine attire as well as her skills at naginata, a sword based martial art practiced by women in Japan. Her restaurant was a refuge for the women who worked in the cannery and lived in meager housing shelters known as fish camp. Um, oftentimes while the men were gone for weeks um, tuna fishing on the ocean. So during my research in San Diego, I spoke with a gentleman who remembered going to Shimoda's restaurant when he was a child. His mother, a close friend of Isa's, worked long hours cleaning fish and could never get rid of the stench off her clothing. They both had vivid memories of Shimoda with her masculine swagger, hand rolling cigarettes and challenging men to sword fights, which she often lost apparently. <laughs> Um, Shimoda also has two sets of wartime records from World War II, the World War II incarceration camps, one identifying Shimoda as female and the other identifying Shimoda as male. 
So my film uses Shimoda's story as a point of departure for honoring the Japanese American women who lived, loved, and worked together during the pre-war era and beyond. The film envisions a fantasy of butch bentos, femme fish filleting, and lesbian desire by establishing multiple spaces of what I would call queer inhabitants, from the mechanized environment of the assembly line to the warm interior of Shimoda's restaurant to an oceanic realm of dancing and sword slinging. And this project really transformed um, my approach to experimental filmmaking. I worked closely with the Center for Asian American Media to find archival home movie footage showing Japanese American women enjoying each other's company. Um, and I incorporated sound found, sorry, found sound, sound that I found um, with a broad range of direct filmmaking techniques involving painting, bleaching, and hand processing film footage. And my ultimate goal was to conjure up an immersive queer fantasy where women might find same-sex intimacy amid sake and fish guts while the men were off to sea. Um, so my second film in the De Young Open is called, is um, May 35. It is a commemoration of the Tiananmen Square uprising. The title, May 35, is a phrase used by activists to evade censorship of online writing and imagery pertaining to the violence that began on June 4th, 1989. So May 35 is May 31 plus four days or June 4th. Um, so this strategy speaks to the difficulty of remembering in the absence of memory, especially when so many traces of the massacre have been censored by the Chinese government. And also when those who bore witness to the past are no, no longer exist in the present. This cameraless film was made from a single image of peaceful protesters taken days before the violence ensued. And I spent six months burning, scraping, and transferring bits of this image onto 16 millimeter clear leader using razor blades and scotch tape, glues, all kinds of things. So although my practice is grounded in research, I'm interested in the ways historical materials can be incorporated into work without appearing as documentary evidence or authoritative proof of a specific narrative. Rather, my films seek to expose the gaps and fissures in historical memory. Spending hours and hours with these materials allows me to explore the tactile dimensions of tra traumatic histories. For me, this labor intensive filmmaking process heightens my visceral and emotional attachment to those lives from the past as a means of paying tribute to them in the present. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. I'm really glad you, you spoke about the process because that was definitely one thing I wanted to ask you about because it, uh, um th that the the materiality of of the filmic image and the tactility like that comes through so it's very visceral even sort of from 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 a, from a viewers and and I, I was curious to hear you know how, how how much you uh you actually sort of uh manipulated the the image itself and so it was great to hear about that and the motivations that that go into it um they're both wonderful films and you know was really really happy to include them and um and i love the uh sort of the openness of it because it has this this um as you say as you were talking about you know you want to talk you want to point out the fissures and the gaps and 
and and these are these are films that are sort of very open in their construction i feel like you you know it, it's not a closed narrative they sort of like really just become these propositions for you to think about different aspects of history um and you know that you're talking about history because of the 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 the, the quality of the imagery um, and you re you recognize them as historical documents, but you don't really know exactly what you're looking at at first. And I find that very powerful. Uh, what are you working on right now? I'm curious to hear. Um, so right now I'm um, working on a couple of projects, but one is about um, Margaret Chung, who mm -hmm. is a well-known uh, Chinese American um, surgeon. Um, she was the first um, female uh, Chinese American woman uh, physician in the U.S. Um, and she worked in Chinatown. Um, and she was also known to be a lesbian, although um, was very private. She was kind of private, not private about it. So she had um, sort of f famous relationships with folks like Elsa Goodlow, a well-known lesbian poet, um, as well as Sophie Tucker, uh, a, a well-known um, entertainer. Um, but her, her story is, is fascinating and layered and complicated. Um, so it's I, right now I'm in the research part of the, the um, process, um, but I'm trying to figure out how to um, create an environment for her story to exist in. And I mean, do you see do you see yourself again working with found footage in the way that you've done in these two examples or will it take a different different form? I'm not really sure. I mean, um, there she was obsessed with celebrity culture and she was friends with folks like Anna Mae Wong who actually played a character that was based on Margaret Chung um, mm -hmm. in a film called The King of Chinatown. Um, so I have archival footage to work with, um, but I'm not exactly sure if that's the direction I'm gonna go. Um, yeah, okay. Well, we're looking forward to seeing it. Um, I would love to hear from you, uh, Angelica, about um, your work, um, which actually was probably the first video I saw when I was reviewing, uh, <laughs> literally when I was reviewing the 4,000 works that had been assigned to me. I think yours was the first wow. one to pop up. So uh, oh. I remember it for that reason also. And I was great. <laughs> I, was, I was so excited to, to, uh, to see something so good. So I would love to hear from you. Oh, well, I am very excited to be here. Um, I guess I'll let you guys play the video and then I'll introduce myself. Mm -hmm. Cool. Landscape prints almost obsessively, constantly pulling visuals of landscape from memories I had as a kid or memories that my ancestors had, memories that were instilled in my psyche and my body. I think as an artist, I was really working through a need for reconnection. Hello, uh, my name is Angelica Trimboyanu, and I am an Oglala Lakota interdisciplinary artist uh, working between monotype printmaking, sculpture, and film. Um, I'm really excited to be here and talk about my film at the Young Open, Maka. Um, how it came to be and sort of the themes that I work around as an Indigenous artist. Um, first off, I just wanted to say that MACA was made possible um, by the support of film site productions and their latest project, CoVideos. Um, CoVideos was launched in March, actually, as a response to the current societal and economic crisis that we're experiencing during COVID-19. Um, so this film project took inspiration um, from the Depression Era's WPA program um, that hired writers, photographers, and artists 
um, to document the struggles and resiliences uh, during a critical moment in history, um, while in return offering financial support. Um, so this gesture felt linear to that of the de Young's main inquiry um, with the open exhibit. Um, the idea of like supporting Bay Area artists and giving our voices a platform. Um, so I felt it was a good submission for the de Young Open. Um, so Maka is an extension of a body of work that I started a couple years ago um, titled Ayeska. Um, about 90% of um, Maka's footage was taken in 2018 um, in my ancestral homelands, um, the Makasika, otherwise known as South Dakota's Badlands. Um, this footage represents a very pivotal moment in my work as an artist, actually. Um, it was my first site-specific collaborative project and it really shaped my thinking around landscape um, identity and sacred space. Um, I began to really think about how these spiritual and political movements in space um, can work as a vessel of sorts um, to sort of articulate these innate connections um, to these cultural landscapes. Um, I think I, in a lot of ways, was looking to translate the untranslatable in a way. Um, so Maka was filmed actually on the grounds of where the Lakota danced our first ghost dance ceremony. Um, and just to give a little tiny bit of history context around the ghost dance, um, it was in a lot of ways part of a religious movement um, in the early 1890s. Um, in response to the US government's attempt of erasure. Um, and so the ghost dance comes from many different histories um, and is not localized to one nation. Um, so I felt that was important to also say. Um, so this landscape um, that you see in Maka um, is where these movements, these perseverances took place. Um, and it, re it represents a greater sense of survivance um, past the ethno-political context. Um, and that was really important to me, um, the idea of honoring the landscapes when I was forming and shooting my Ayeska sculptures. Um, so these sculptural landscape forms operate more as entities um, that animate a unexplainable relationship I have to indigenous geographies, um, specifically South Dakota. Uh, so my work began to represent this sort of futurism or abstraction um, of temporalities um, that cannot and are not determined by subtler notions of time and space. Um, so in consideration of the prompt I was given for co-videos um, and the nature of my work, I felt that reworking the footage of my Ayesca sculptures and that process was a really powerful container um, for these political and personal mobilizations. Um, so I kind of I wanted to share a couple images um, of my monotype print work um, that also reflects similar lines of inquiry as Maka. Um, so in the first image, you look to see what the light lets in and ascend. Um, I use subtle notions and references uh, to traditional Lakota concepts around color and form. Um, to then hold space uh, for my ancestors um, by also protecting our stories, by positioning my work in a place that is non-exploitative, um, maybe non-descriptive. Um, so my work is in some ways really undefinable and works to fight native erasure with subtlety and abstractions. Um, I feel like I have a, a very specific audience that I try to reach with my work, and a lot of that is my Lakota community. Um, and I think that futurism has become a really critical keyword 
uh, across my practice as it helps me sort of resist this Western gaze that I find can be really present um, in a lot of contemporary art institutions. Um, so my work sort of propels itself into the future and stands as a presence of sorts or a form of activism, I guess you could say. Um, I feel there's a, a powerful sense of otherworldliness or alienscape maybe um, to my landscape sculptures and monotypes. Um, so creating this jump to take native presence out of the past through the now and into the future is really important to me as an artist. Thank you. <laughs> Can you expand a little further on this, on this idea of futurism and, and how you, how you feel that you actually reach your Lakota audiences? I mean, in what, you know, what are the vehicles that you use to, to actually reach who you want to talk to? Absolutely. Um, color and shape are sort of those main vehicles for me, um, specifically the color yellow. Mm -hmm. um, is recognizable um, by my elders and my family. Um, it's a sacred color. It's something that you see in a lot of our contemporary textiles. Um, it's sort of a subtle nod uh, to my ancestors, um, giving them a space um, that connects them to me in the now, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also shape, um, shape. I mean, growing up, a lot of the stories I was told as a kid, um, the sort of circular shape was um, something that was reoccurring in the stories that I was told and a, sort of this idea of um, a circle of life and reincarnation. Um, and so my work subtly ties, you know, kind of pays homage to those things without um, explicitly saying this is a sacred Lakota color. Um, yeah. So I find that that, that subtle transmission um, is really where the power is. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of like, a lot of the Lakota um, family that I've shown my work to um, will see you know, the Black Hills and my, like my mark making will be like, oh, the, that's the Black Hills. Um, that's our, you know, our sacred um, Hesapa. And um, I've talked to a lot of friends of mine who are, who don't come from indigenous backgrounds and a lot of them see t like tree rings and there's all these different um, interpretations of my work. And I think they're all fascinating and valid. Um, but I, I think there's a really interesting thing going on with this sort of abstraction and subtlety. Yeah, thank you. And I'm also interested uh, to hear more about um, the relationship in terms of exhi exhibiting the work, you sort of like you, the ideal circumstance, because obviously in the De Young Open, we're showing your film of which we've <laughs> just seen an excerpt, but clearly, um, you're a sculptor, you know, a printmaker, uh, you work across all these mediums. And, and I was curious to what extent it actually is important for you to show those together. Um, how did you feel about us? I, I, you know, I honestly don't know if you submitted other work, if you submitted sculptural work or work in print uh, and, and maybe it didn't get in, I don't know. I'm, so I'm curious to hear, did you only submit the film? Did you submit work in multiple media? Did we end up you know, it's sort of selecting the film, but not other, not not these types of works. And it, is that an ideal situation for you, or would you rather show it all together? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I did actually submit one of the Ayeska sculptures. You did, um, okay. With yeah. the film, the one that you see all the way to the right there, mm -hmm. um, and I kind of go back and forth on this. Um, a lot of, I kind of feel a sense of protection um, over the actual sculptures themselves. Um, so more recently, I kind of have been more hesitant to actually put the sculptures um, out for display um, because there is such a strong 
spiritual connection to them. I sort of feel this weird motherly sense of like protection. Um, so I was actually really happy that you guys selected my film over the sculptures themselves mm -hmm. because I felt like it did give it, um, give my work a lot of context, but it also um, gave my work that layer of protection that is actually kind of important. Um, these sculptures traveled with me for a week long um, in South Dakota and visited a lot of sacred sites with me and they hold a lot for me. Um, mm -hmm. So at this point in my practice, um, I am more hesitant to actually show these sculptures. Um, and I think that's something that I'm still kind of like thinking through and working through in my idea of the sacred and what to share and what to, you know, not share. Um, so yeah, no, I was really happy that you guys selected uh, Maka because um, it was it was a really fun film to make and hopefully it won't be my last, so. Is it your first though? It is, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh yeah, it's my first. So <laughs> I'm sort of, I've always used uh, digital documentation um, in the process of making my work, but I've never really put it out into the world. I have like hundreds of hours of footage of me in South Dakota making these sculptures, um, but I never really found a way to put it out in the world until now, so. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, so I, I was curious whether you had questions for one another, but you know, there's no pressure here at all. If you don't, that's okay too. <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, Titi a question. Um, yes, I'm here. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, your work is really amazing, by the way. I had a chance to kind of look at your website and stuff, but um, I was wondering if reincarnation plays a role in your work at all, or if those are sort of any ideas that kind of surface when you're processing and um, yeah, just with your materials and everything and just sort of your thoughts on reincarnation. Wow, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, I haven't thought about my work in the context of reincarnation in particular, but I, I definitely feel like um, when I'm doing work about uh, queer Japanese Americans and that history, because that history is not um, talked about very much and there's not a lot of evidence. So I definitely feel like I am looking for queer ancestors or trying to um, create spaces of, of fantasy and desire that they might have wanted to exist in or that I you know look back and hope that they had they had that experience so um I guess one could see that in the context of reincarnation you know I, I definitely um spend so much time with the material that I I feel a really close connection with the the lives of the folks that I that I'm uh, that I investigate. So thanks so much for that question. Yeah. yeah, when you were talking about your process of reworking your materials and spending such close time with them for like long lengths of time, I just kept thinking reincarnation, reincarnation in my head. And I don't know where that came from really, but um, yeah, no, thank you for answering that question for me. Gazelle, what are, you, what are you working on now? Are you working on a new film too? Um, actually, I'm working on a project that has some resonances with uh, some of the work of uh, Titi and Angelica. <laughs> oh, um, really? Yeah. Tell us more. Uh, a few years ago, I uh, created a four channel video called My Shadow is a Word Writing Itself Across Time. And it was looking, it was using, um, the Japanese American incarceration in Manzanar, California, as like a jumping off point for um, exploring like forgotten histories. Because in that area, um, Peyu and Shoshone Indians were forcibly removed. And then the settlers who followed were also 
pushed out when Los Angeles bought the water rights to the area. And then I was also struck by the landscape, um, having residences with Afghanistan and thinking about how the war in Afghanistan, which is the US's longest war now is basically like forgotten. Um, so I'm currently working on an artist book that is encompassing photographs and writing um, poetry because the video also had a poetry, or excuse me, a poem that was written by an Afghan American poet um, and handmade paper, which is using some of the like leaves from that particular part of California. So I think when um, TT talked about like gaps and fissures in historical memory, I was really thinking about that in relation to this project. And then um, Angelica mentioned the, I think the ghost dance. Mm -hmm. And that was something I had also learned about with the Peyu Indians and in Afghan culture, we also have a round dance called Atan. So um, the project's not meant to like equivocate different like injustices, but um, it is definitely kind of trying to connect things across space and time. I mean, I feel all of your work does that, you know, to a certain extent, sort of like unearthing, um, unearthing histories, bringing them into the light, literally through film, uh, in this case, and uh, and uh, and and dealing with all the sort of multiple dimensions of existence and reality um, through space and time, and how that sort of like gets imprinted onto film is something that I just find very powerful in all of your work. Miguel, do you, do you have uh, any closing words for us? So uh, we have like one minute left. <laughs> Not really, I'm just so excited to be part of this panel and just part of the, of the show. I think the show has, will be one of the, I don't know, a show that will be talked in the Bay Area history um, in one of the most, I don't know, talk time of all times. <laughs> Uh, well, 2020. I don't know about that, but okay. Well, <laughs> 2020 <laughs> seems like just the year. Like, um, but, so I'm just just happy about that silver lining of the show that is in my life. Yeah. Thank you, Miguel. With those words, I would like to open the conversation up to our audience. I hope everybody is taking this opportunity to ask questions. Uh, you, you can type them into the chat and I will read them to the artists. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentations and have lots of follow-up questions. So please shoot. Okay, so here is a question for TT. TT, do you have plans to explore Japanese invasions during World War II? and how sexuality intersects with sexual identities in post-war Japan. Oh, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, it's really, it's a great question. Um, I have presented some of my work um, in Japan and also in Okinawa. Um, and although I, I'm fourth generation Japanese American, so, you know, I, I don't speak Japanese um, and part of that is the legacy of wartime because my uh, parents and grandparents were incarcerated and so uh, my grandparents decided not to teach my parents how to speak Japanese. Um, and um, so I didn't grow up with, um, with, with that orientation. Um, I didn't um, have the opportunity to visit Japan until I was an adult. Um, but I am really interested in conversations about um, the legacy of war, uh, especially in the context of Okinawa. And then also I do have connections with folks um, who are part of the queer LGBT community in Tokyo and, and areas um, 
outside of Tokyo. Um, and I think they're having their own really incredible conversations about, um, about sexuality um, and, um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm just eager to think about that more. The next question is for Angelica. Um, Angelica, you mentioned that you translate the untranslatable. Can you please share a little more about how this influences um, the topics or issues you choose to focus on? Oh, did we lose her? I think Angelica just disappeared. So maybe I'll re re take that question back when she comes back into the Zoom. But Miguel, there's a question for you and uh, uh, about the, the new work or the work in progress that you presented earlier. Um, somebody would like to know if you could explain a little further um, the, uh, the th you know, your connection to the themes of life and death within that work and how you represent that. Um, there's also curiosity about your dancing in this particular piece, whether you had a specific style or movement in mind as you went about filming it, or were you freestyling or improvising as you were doing it? Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, life, I think that has been more than that, the core of my work. I think, I think that's what I use uh, moving image I think that the, the window that represents life, that's I think it's a, how I find my language to connect, uh, communicate. I think communication is that representation of life. And I think I have been diving with this um, idea. I think that's how life uh, sort of plays with the themes in my work. In the new What If Work that I'm working on, for some reason, but not for some reason, I think 2020 is very debt heavy. Um, I think also being uh, in the United States for five years or so, feeling um, the death of family members or friends that I'm no longer there with them on a daily basis. That feels like in some, where, in some ways a death, the lack of communication. That's how I interpret it or that's how I feel. Um, and I think that's what I'm longing for to create perhaps is like, um, peace of mind on understanding death or like what does death means to me. Um, and I think this piece, or, or that's why I understand it. That's why like, I wanna research like understanding from the Metroid falling in Chicxulub in Yucatan, detonating a whole change in the world and how today, I guess, all the humans are doing that to the world. Um, so I think that's, what I'm thinking about that. I mean, this just like these two polarizing ideas, right? Like one cannot be without the other. Um, I live with, a, my dad is a veterinarian. So the conversation of death and being alive was like a, something we talk like on a daily basis. It was so normal to talk about death while we were just having dinner. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, and I think I just like finding those moments where I'm just trying to be comfortable with that. Uh, in my work and in my life. Uh, about the dance, uh, I'm, a, I'm a salsa dancer. That's what you grew up doing in Campeche, you dance salsa. Uh, I also did hip hop. I also am a black belt in Taekwondo. And I also love to do Tai Chi with my grandmother when she was doing it. Um, and that's where those dance moves are. I think it's a mix of all that uh, very, uh, naked space in my brain represented and captured by the camera. I think that's what it is. I guess the question was, do you choreograph it or do you just improvise in front of the camera? No, I, you know, it's just like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah. doing it. Oh, great, Angelica is back. Sorry, I think we lost you there for a second. Yeah. I, I had just read a question for you. Um, I don't know if you if you heard that, but the question was, you mentioned that you translate the untranslatable in your work. And if you could share a little more about what that means and, and how that influences the, the issues that you choose to focus on in your work. Definitely. Um, sorry about that. My internet connection is really bad. Um, 
But yeah, that is a really great question. Um, so I, my work, I guess, I mean, a lot of the work that I do, I'm thinking about, you know, the sort of, um, you know, I work between the spiritual world and the human world. And so a lot of my work um, explores sort of that relationship um, between, you know, like an ancestral world and my own. Um, and I guess what I'm really trying to translate in my work is um, sort of that back and forth that I go through um, making contemporary work. Um, but I think that, I mean, that question's interesting because uh, the title of these sculptures is Ayeska. And Ayeska is um, a Lakota term for interpreter. Um, it's a term that was born between um, the children of like the white settlers and the Sioux. And um, Ayeskas were, you know, they were called, you know, speak white. And it was to communicate. Um, you know, a lot of um, the Lakota had to communicate with government agents and sort of serve as this like first generation translator between two worlds, um, between sort of the old way of living and then trying to like, I guess, assimilate in a lot of ways into, um, you know, the, that new experience. Um, and so for me, um, my work becomes sort of a container for interpretation. Um, so I'm really interested in those sort of notions. And I, I think that's a really complica complicated and great question that I definitely want to spend some more time thinking about. Um, but hopefully that answered the, the question. Thank you. And Gazelle, for you, a question from the audience. Um, your presentation made me think of Ariadne's thread and uh, the, the, the symbolism of love that is um, also attached to uh, that mythology and the gesture. Uh, was that something you were thinking about in that work when you're using the thread or the line? Um, no, that's, that's a really interesting insight. Um, I'm definitely interested in mythology and fairy tales. And I think, um, you know, growing up there, these fairy tales, for example, of I, I don't remember if it was like Hansel and Gretel who follows the path. And um, I think um, I use thread kind of as a symbol for a connection. Um, and I was interested in playing with this idea of like curiosity on the girl's part, but also that leading to something that um, can be entangling constricting um, but I'll definitely have to look more into that um, mythology and think more about um, how that can that idea of like love and and the line how that can play into my work well and also the uh, the notion of escape right that is in, involved in that because at the end of the day uh, the thread is is led to lead Theseus out of the labyrinth and save him from the Minotaur <laughs> at the end of the day. So there is that also that that idea of of liberation and of rescue somehow that is attached to that to that myth in that way. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question for all of you, um, which is, you know, who are the, the thinkers, whether they're artists, writers uh, or other cultural figures? That, that you find yourself to be in dialogue with, that you feel that you have a conversation with both as, you know, as, as, as uh, individuals, but as artists uh, through your work? Uh, are there particular people that you would like the audience to know about that are important for your research and your thinking and your development of the work? I guess I can start. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I, so right when I first started um, printing and um, starting that process of monotype printmaking, I 
came across a painter and maker named James Labrador. Um, and he is from Walla Walla. Um, and he, his way of um, talking about the sort of transfiguration of like energy through painting landscapes um, really resonated with me. Um, he had one specific piece that he did um, where he pretty much, he took one of his paintings and used a digital rendering program. I don't know exactly what it's called, but he put his painting through that program and it created this 3D sort of landscape of his work. Um, and then that painting actually was the exact um, like landscape of like one of the rivers that he grew up around. And it was sort of this beautiful, fascinating moment um, of him experiencing this like innate connection to his homeland um, through painting. And I found that project like really inspiring and powerful to me. So yeah, his work is really amazing. You guys should go check it out. Great, anybody else? Um, so I would say a writer that has been very uh, influential to me is Jose Esteban Munoz, who is a queer theorist, um, who's written very eloquently about um, uh, queer utopia and notions of queer futurity um, and the idea that, you know, oftentimes queer folks um, use very DIY methods to um, imagine new possibilities or landscapes for themselves, to create spaces for themselves with whatever they have, um, folks like Jack Smith and other folks. So, um, and, and he talks a lot about um, how we look to the past to also imagine what the future might look like. So those are ideas that I, I take with me. Great. I'm just gonna drop the film they make my students watch every time I teach a class. <laughs> it's called World of Tomorrow. It's a animation, short, uh, short animation. Um, it's by Don Hertzfeld. And this film is about sort of similar to TT, uh, this character that travels to the past to meet their, this clone that travels to the past to meet their year like kid self um, and to really understand where the memories were left behind. Um, and then in this film, there was this beautiful moment of a museum that has memories of others. And that's what the museum has. That's what is portrayed as art. And I thought that was, I don't know, for me, mind blowing, I think as an artist to, to cherish memories as like masterpieces. That's beautiful. I need to watch that film. You need to send me a link. <laughs> Gazelle, do you have um, anybody that you would like to point towards? Yeah, one artist that inspires me is Rada Amer, who's an Egyptian artist and works in multimedia. But she did these large scale canvases um, where she embroidered um, images of women taken actually from pornography. And then like the threads of the outline of the images kind of obscured the shapes and like from a distance kind of looked like an abstract Pollock type painting. So I was really interested in the way she was um, like hiding and revealing and questioning um, images of women in her work. Yeah, she's a very important artist, great artist that I also appreciate very much. Thank you all for this. I, uh, I'm really curious to hear more, but I, I'm afraid we are at time. And so at this point, uh, I would like to thank you all for um, participating, for making the work that you do. And I hope that uh, we will all get through this second iteration of the lockdown uh, sanely and healthily and productively. I hope it uh, uh, is a place from which you can work um, 
and make work in ways that uh, that is uh, transformative, not for you, but also for us. And uh, I certainly look forward to meeting at the other end of this pandemic sometime soon in person, which would be really lovely and not on Zoom. So thank you all and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank Thanks you, so much. Michelle and Helica, Titi, Miguel and Claudia. That was wonderful. Next week, please join us for our third and final round of presentations from the artists featured in the De Young Open exhibition. We will explore the art of textiles, hosted by Jill D'Alessandro, our curator in charge of costume and textiles art. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next week.